Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Michael Green from uh, CSIS, and together with our co-hosts for this uh, event, uh, Jack Pritchard and the Korea Economic Institute, and Professor Carl Jackson and SICE, U.S. Korea Institute, I want to say what a pleasure it is to welcome Lael Brainerd, the Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs, for a report on uh, the G20 and the economic aspects of the President's uh, visit to Korea. Um, uh, I will uh, introduce Lael, and then we're going to ask um, Carl to open with the first question, and and uh, Ambassador Pritchard will wrap up. Um, I've known Lael for some time, and uh, I've thought that if Marvel Comics ever decided to make an action movie about international finance, the superhero character would, would have to be based on Lael. Now, <laughs> Lael's brother-in-law works in Hollywood and knows there's not a lot of demand for action movies about Sherpa and negotiating joint statements and currency account and surplus issues and so forth. Uh, but her resume is truly impressive, and she has had a uh, hand in uh, all the major international economic policy issues uh, uh, in two of the last three administrations. Um, she was uh, tenured at MIT in the economics faculty after getting her PhD at, at Harvard and served as the deputy national economic advisor uh, and deputy assistant uh, to President Clinton for international economics. That's not me. <laughs> and uh, turn off your cell phones if you don't mind. And um, uh, at Brookings started a major program on international development finance and trade, and now serves as the Undersecretary of the Treasury for uh, International Affairs. Um, we uh, uh, are hosting this with KEI and, uh, and uh, with uh, SICE, uh, in part because this is such a remarkable moment for the Republic of Korea. Um, this is the first G20 hosted by a non-G7 country. Um, Koreans often describe themselves as shrimp among whales in Northeast Asia, and, and uh, here there, there were 19 other whales. and. Uh, uh, President Yimang Bok pulled off uh, quite a successful summit meeting. Um, I think it's not unfair to say President Obama has taken a few lumps in the press uh, over aspects of the G20, and I, I know from uh, experience in government, I'm sure Carl does, that the narrative the media builds is uh, often not the narrative of what happened in the room and where you actually stand on building an agenda on issues, and I think we'll all look forward to hearing Lael's report on, on where we stand on some of the um, con contentious issues like, uh, like currency, some of the issues that didn't, in my view, get enough play, like the development agenda. And I can guarantee uh, you'll get questions on the Korea Free Trade Agreement. Uh, so it's a rich menu. Um, uh, Lael will serve us the first course, then we'll, then we'll turn to Carl. Thank you for joining us. It's a real privilege and a, and a pleasure for us. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here, uh, to be back at uh, CSIS. and. Um, it's great to be here with Mike, and I, uh, I think um, just wanted to congratulate him. He is uh, the proud father of a four-week-old baby girl in addition to his uh, three-year-old uh, son. So congratulations to Mike. Um, and it's uh, delightful to be here. Thank you to CSIS, to KEI, and to SICE for hosting uh, all of us here today. Um, all three institutes, I think your efforts to advance the policy debate here in Washington and more broadly uh, around the world are vital uh, to furthering uh, policy innovation uh, and leadership. I will uh, focus my comments today on the outcomes and the accomplishments of the past few weeks of international economic engagement, uh, focusing on the President's trip to Indonesia, India, South Korea, and Japan, of course the G20. Um, but let me start uh, by just uh, recounting one of my own recent experiences here. On a recent tour of a plant uh, near Albany, a plant manager of more than 30 years described his company's efforts to look for new ways to make their processes and products better so they can compete in the most highly competitive markets around the world. He had incredible enthusiasm and optimism and energy. And essentially, he said, we want to be number one, and we are constantly looking for new ideas uh, that will help put us there and keep us there. And that captures, I think, for me, in a nutshell, why we are working so hard to put in place a policy framework that will move the U.S. economy from recovery to renewal, that will get Americans back to work, and that will get businesses back to investing here at home. As President Obama said on his way back from Asia, we should feel confident about our ability to compete, but we need to step up our game. Exports lie at the heart of our efforts to step up our game. The President's goal of doubling exports in five years provides a very clear prism to ensure that all of our policies 
remain relentlessly focused on expanding opportunities for American businesses and American workers. Our engagement in the G20 and APEC and ASEAN, as well as bilaterally with key partners such as Korea and China, are core components of that effort to revitalize America's innovative edge and renew our competitiveness. Let me quickly touch on the three key elements of this effort with reference to the President's uh, trip to Asia and then be delighted uh, to uh, have a conversation, answer some questions. So first, let me just talk about uh, the broad growth agenda, which really centrally uh, involves our efforts at the G20. Going into uh, the crisis, our growth was unhealthy and unbalanced. It was fueled by cheap credit and it fueled, in turn, massive export surpluses abroad. Looking forward, we all need to find more sustainable sources of dynamism in our economy and around the world, sources of dynamism that will enable jobs to return and businesses to reinvest. Helping to put growth on that sounder footing was the very core of our discussions at APEC and the G20. As advanced economies like the U.S. continue repairing balance sheets and deleveraging and putting public finances on a sounder footing, we're going to have to work with other major economies to support new engines of growth for the global economy. And in turn, countries that previously relied on the American consumer to fuel their economic expansion will need to identify new sources of growth. Fortunately, there is ample opportunity to do so, particularly in the emerging markets where consumer needs and infrastructure needs can provide those new engines of growth for the world economy. In Seoul, we went in with a agenda for rebalancing global demand and for a policy agenda to support it. And we came out of Seoul with unanimity around that plan, around that growth agenda, with agreement that strengthening global growth is the primary goal and that the imperative is to shift demand in order to lift overall growth. The G20 leaders committed to a new framework to curb excessive imbalances and noted that all economies, surplus no less than deficit, have a shared responsibility to engage in this rebalancing effort. To take action, the G20 will work in the coming months to develop a set of indicators that will serve as an early warning system to ensure preventive and corrective actions. We will now work closely on a time frame agreed by G20 leaders in the G20 and the international, with the support of the International Monetary Fund, to agree those indicators and to assess country policy trajectories against them. And of course, there was agreement that exchange rate policies will be a central focus of those discussions. The G20 recognized the important role of market determined exchange rates in helping to facilitate rebalancing. And of course, we are working hard to ensure that China, in particular, makes progress in allowing its exchange rate to appreciate in response to market forces as Chinese officials reaffirmed their commitment to do. We have noted uh, the accelerated pace of appreciation in recent months, which, if sustained, would make a material difference uh, to uh, correcting uh, the undervaluation of the currency. So in Seoul, we essentially uh, came in trying to set a forward growth agenda, one that would provide a cooperative path forward for countries that are currently engaging in, in engaging on very different growth paths. And we felt that we came out with not only a commitment around that basic proposition, but a framework for action and timelines to ensure that it moves forward. Secondly, we were very focused uh, throughout the trip on expanding export opportunities. As the President traveled through the fast-growing markets of Asia, he emphasized the key role of opening new markets to support growth and jobs. In 2009, exports made up only 12 percent of U.S. GDP, the smallest percentage of leading economies. If we want to create broad-based and sustainable growth here in the U.S., we have to expand export opportunities by strengthening trade rules in key markets, by enforcing the rules that we have, and of course by supporting our exporters from the largest multinationals to the newest startups. The administration is providing support for small and medium-sized businesses through Exim, 
and through finding and removing obstacles to exporting. Uh, we have heard uh, stories going across the country we, uh, from many small businesses on how critically important those programs are uh, to getting into growth markets abroad. And commerce's advocacy on behalf of America's exporters is also yielding imp important gains that we saw as President Obama traveled through Asia, where we saw the finalization of nearly $15 billion uh, in, in export uh, contracts. Trade agreements are likewise important. On the bilateral side, President Obama noted that he is committed to completing negotiations with South Korea on the free trade agreement as quickly as possible. Progress has been made, but USTR will keep working to improve chorus so it is beneficial to American industry and workers. If done right, this agreement could increase the annual exports of American goods by some 10 billion and even more in services. And of course, the President also reiterated his commitment to complete the pending agreements with Colombia and Panama. Regionally, at the APEX summit, the President discussed progress on the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which can serve as a platform for economic integration in the fast-growing Asia-Pacific region and a model for a world-class 21st century trade agreement. Multilateral USTR is continuing to seek a successful conclusion to the Doha Round, and in particular, expanded market access commitments from dynamic emerging economies. But of course, as we move forward on these efforts to strengthen trade rules, we also need to make sure that we enforce the very important trade rules we have. And we are vigorously pursuing a number of WTO cases and, and investigating uh, Section 301 uh, petition in particular. And then the final piece of the agenda, which uh, is really uh, about our strengthening our capacity here at home, is the President's commitment to strengthen our economy. And again, as we look around the world, it should be an invitation to us uh, to step up our game. The President's innovation strategy is one of our key efforts to harness the ingenuity of American workers and industry, uh, focusing on the building blocks of innovation, education, infrastructure, advanced communications, technologies, and of course R&D. As the President traveled in Asia, he also observed that countries were investing in infrastructure, while the United States is still living off our investments from decades ago, noting that it's past time to upgrade our roads, railways, and runways, the President has proposed a $50 billion infrastructure fund to bolster our competitiveness through infrastructure investments. We should learn from the efforts of other nations as we pursue these investments. And finally, of course, tax initiatives are another area where we can provide incentives to invest today for the future. We have proposed and expanded R&D tax credit and 100 percent expensing of capital investments as several of our broader initiatives to spur investment. It is also critically important uh, that we strengthen our financial system, that we make it more resilient, and that we bring other countries along in that effort so that we're engaged in a race to the top, not a race to the bottom. At the G20, leaders embrace the new bank capital and liquidity standards uh, that are part of Basel III. This was a, an effort that we put on the agenda, the President put on the agenda in Pittsburgh, and we have delivered on it in record time. In uh, Seoul, leaders agreed, like in the Dodd-Frank legislation here, that no firm is too big to fail, that all countries need robust resolution regimes similar to the one we have here, and that the world needs to ensure that the largest, most interconnected firms have greater loss absorbency so that taxpayers uh, need never bear those burdens again. The G20 also addressed the need to move forward together to strengthen regu uh, regulation of derivatives markets. And finally, of course, uh, there were very important um, agreement uh, was put on the table to ensure uh, that the IMF uh, would be stronger, uh, more uh, and better equipped to deal with crises of the future and more representative recognizing uh, that as the dynamic emerging uh, markets are playing a greater role in the system, so too they have greater responsibilities in the system. The G20 summit and the full scope of the trip to Asia showcased an America that's committed to working hard to remain innovative, competitive, and strong. We came away with strong agreement among our G20 partners on the core growth challenge that we faced and on a process and a timetable for delivering on it. Of course, the task before us now is to take the hard steps of action and implementation. 
And as we go forward, uh, we feel that the efforts that we are undertaking here at home are, are of a piece with those efforts that we're undertaking with our trade partners, both bilaterally, regionally, and of course multilaterally through the G20. So with that, let me conclude and uh, look forward to uh, the discussion and taking your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lael. You've given us an excellent introduction to where we are coming out of the G20 and APEC and, and what to look for in the months ahead. And listening to you, uh, I think we can all be very thankful you're on, you're on the job and on the case. Um, we, I'll call on people from up here. Uh, there's a microphone. I'd ask that you identify yourself briefly, uh, keep questions short, and uh, we'll begin the process by turning to my colleague from SICE, Carl Jackson, in the front. Thank you very much. I'm Carl Jackson uh, from SICE, uh, Chairman of Asian Studies. Um, I was thinking, uh, as you were talking, about uh, a fellow named Toshiki Kaifu, who was Prime Minister of Japan. Uh, when I uh, had certain responsibilities in uh, the American government. I remember him very clearly turning to me, looking me in the eye and promising me uh, that Japan would become an import superpower. I'm still waiting. Uh, and with regard to uh, the appreciation of the renminbi, I think it's very important, uh, important not only to the United States but to the world, and I'm wondering what the benchmarks are that we should be looking for uh, concerning whether or not we're succeeding or falling behind on that particular initiative. I think the, uh, the important thing to recognize uh, is that the crisis made clear uh, to reformers in China, to policymakers in China more generally, um, the view that their growth model was no longer a particularly good growth model for them any more than it is for the world. And in particular, I think there was a recognition, uh, and we're seeing this play out a little bit in their policy debate, uh, that they have a tremendous internal capacity uh, to promote domestically driven growth uh, that is healthier growth, that their growth model was excessively dependent uh, on an overextended American consumer. So one of the things I think uh, that uh, we can see playing out in this dynamic is there is actually a recognition coming out of the crisis uh, that this growth model needs to change uh, and that more broadly there needs to be a shift uh, in global demand. The second thing I would say uh, with regard to that is the exchange rate is, is we think, very important uh, to this rebalancing effort uh, in China and a number of other countries uh, that have uh, been uh, cautious uh, on allowing their exchange rate to reflect uh, economic fundamentals and uh, market forces. Um, and so we're going to be working bilaterally through the SNED, multilaterally through the G20 and other mechanisms. And as, as we've looked at the exchange rate, we have noted uh, that the pace of appreciation since September 1st has picked up. And that this pace of appreciation that we've seen uh, in the recent uh, weeks has actually uh, been a pace that, if sustained, would make a material difference to the undervaluation of the currency. But I think the third piece that I would point out is uh, that as we engage in this broader rebalancing, it is also uh, important um, and part of uh, the uh, policy trajectory within China to also see a number of supporting um, economic reforms uh, to help promote the role of uh, domestic consumption in driving growth. And so these, these uh, policy reforms are complementary to each other. It's not just the exchange rate, it's also supporting the role of the consumer and reducing the perceived need uh, for precautionary savings. We think these things work together. And the framework that uh, was agreed and embraced uh, at the G20 in Seoul recognizing, recognizes that it is that complex of policies uh, that countries like China, not China alone, uh, need to undertake structural as well as uh, exchange rate policies that will help shift the broader growth model to one uh, that has more engines of growth uh, and that we think uh, will be more sustainable for the world economy as we, as we repair our balance sheets.
Hi, thank you. Uh, Casey Farrell with the Center for Global Development. Um, the G20 Development Action Plan included language to expand market access uh, for the least developed countries, um, but this commitment did not come to fruition during the summit. What is the administration's position on providing full duty-free, quota-free market access to the world's poorest countries, particularly in the context of this global collective growth and the absence of the Doha Round? Let me um, just uh, step back for one second and um, just uh, give a nod uh, to President Lee and to the Korean team more generally uh, for the really outstanding effort uh, that they undertook. I think as Mike said earlier, this was uh, the first time that a country who had not previously been part of the G8 uh, undertook to lead the G20. And uh, so I think it was quite a test of their leadership in their vision, and I must say they put a very ambitious agenda on the table, and they delivered on it across the board. Um, one of the areas that they put on the table, uh, which reflected their own growth experience, uh, was a very robust development uh, agenda, as you said, the development action plan, that reflected their own experience of growth uh, being at the center of their efforts, uh, and the important role of trade, the important role of infrastructure, uh, and a host of other factors in their own successful development story. With regard to um, the uh, discussions about market access for the poorest, um, those conversations will continue in the context of the Doha Round, and I think the leaders gave um, renewed impetus uh, to the Doha Round discussions made very clear what additional needs to be on the table to take that forward. But I'll also say that, as you know, um, our efforts here in the U.S., in particular through AGOA, are widely acknowledged to provide some of the best access uh, in the world. And in fact, there have been calls for other countries to emulate the extent of access that we provide through AGOA and to, to, um, to reflect that more broadly. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm John Ruthroff. I'm uh, Director of International Advocacy at Interaction, an alliance of 200 U.S. NGOs. Um, we are very pleased of the extension that Seoul, the government, led on the development side. One area that is, is uh, in growing is the financial inclusion uh, area. And the, um, the multi-year action plan describes the global partnership for financial inclusion that's being set up. And it lists three organizations that are part of that all policy level or World Bank connected. Um, I was wondering, one, how that's going to happen, but also how the civil society input will be taken into account in terms of the design and um, implementation of it. Yeah, so one of the areas that um, certainly at Treasury uh, we were most excited about was this financial inclusion agenda. I would say that expanding uh, access uh, to financial um, services, both for um, poor communities as well as for the small uh, enterprises, is something that is a uh, widely shared uh, policy goal um, throughout the G20, including, of course, in the U.S., and also well beyond the G20. And one of the great things about the financial inclusion agenda within the G20 is it goes beyond the G20 membership, and it has key uh, developing countries that have done some very innovative things in terms of banking the unbanked, using uh, mobile telephony as a uh, mechanism for expanding uh, access. Uh, and as we take that forward, we'll use some of the existing uh, mechanisms multilaterally. Of course, CGAP will be very involved in those work, in that work, and, and I think there will be um, a desire uh, to uh, include the very important um, uh, players uh, in uh, civil society who have made a lot of uh, innovations. And in fact, I just want to highlight one piece. The, um, the President Lee and President Obama uh, presided over an award ceremony uh, for um, a number of SME, small and medium sized enterprise financing uh, groups uh, that had all been engaged in a, um, a, an innovation prize that was run on behalf of the G20 by civil society, and these were of course groups out in civil society who um, were being recognized for pioneering some of the most innovative mechanisms to scale up and leverage financing. And so you could see right there that there was an integral role uh, for civil society to play in that, both in innovation and also in implementation. Thank you very much, Raghubir Gaur, India Globe and Asia today. Um, Madam, uh, President's trip to India 
was a billions of dollar deal with the Indian companies and with the government of India. Now, as far as the India's investment in the U.S. is concerned, already cr creating thousands of jobs here. But the new deal will create more than 50 or 60,000 jobs in the U.S. Now, there is a much demand in, in India for made in USA. What do you think are you going to export to India made in USA that this new deal is going to bring? There were a variety of different um, uh, kinds of products that were uh, uh, in, that were actually uh, finalized uh, in in uh, the, the the transactions that were announced in India. But we already have a very broad set of exporting relationships uh, with India, and there's tremendous uh, opportunity there, as you know. In particular, the government's very focused um, on infrastructure investments, and of course, American companies have huge uh, uh, amounts of innovative. Products products to uh, bring to bear there, you know, ranging from transport to clean energy. So I think there's a, a lot of opportunity. The president spoke to this, met with uh, CEOs from both the U.S. Uh, and India. And of course, you know, what's so great about the relationship between the U.S. and India is it's really very driven by the two dynamic private sectors of both countries. You, you, in both cases, you have these very dynamic private sectors and very engaged in a whole set of transactions, uh, investments, uh, and exports. So I think the, you know, the future there has a lot of promise. Um, I'm going to jump in queue and ask a question that shifts a bit from content to structure. And you in the Clinton administration had experience managing G7, G8 meetings. Uh, G20 is exponentially more complicated politically, uh, ge geometrically, and in terms of diversity of uh, government types and development levels. I wonder if you could say something about um, how it felt mechanically. And, and there are people out there who say the G20 can't survive. It was basically created in a crisis, and it's just too big. And if you could you know, give us your impressions about what you see as the st structural viability of the G20 going into the future, that would be uh, helpful. Yeah, so I think this is a really um, important uh, dimension uh, that we all need to be highly aware of. You know, we are uh, constantly comparing, I think, the G20 um, with the G7, G8, you know, which had a 25-year history. A uh, number of uh, countries that uh, were at similar levels of economic development uh, and who had developed over decades uh, deep habits of economic cooperation and of working through uh, challenges together. So um, as we have moved, it is critically important, as President Obama said at, at Pittsburgh when we moved decisively to the G20 as the premier forum, it is critically important that the Indias and the Chinas um, and the Koreas uh, be at the table because of their role in the system. Um, but it is, there are both more countries at the table and, of course, um, more different um, growth trajectories. And I think that was, in many respects, um, what we saw as the uh, backdrop coming into this meeting uh, is, you know, we were moving from a period of crisis response, which characterized the first two years of this organization, where policy challenges and policy responses were much more uniform across the countries in the room to a period where uh, we are now experiencing quite different growth trajectories and challenges. Many of the emerging markets are coping with the uh, rather good challenge of very rapid growth um, and a lot of interest in investing in those economies. And some of the advanced economies are uh, still working through repair of their financial systems, uh, repair of their balance sheets, the deleveraging process. That's why we thought it was so important coming into this meeting that we bring a new agenda, that we reset the agenda going forward to bring those disparate countries together around a common growth path, a cooperative growth path with different policy prescriptions for different types of countries, but that together those policy trajectories would be a win-win. And so I think that is what we saw in Seoul. Uh, but you're right, this is a work in progress, and it's, gonna, it's going to require continued engagement um, and very um, complicated diplomacy. The gentleman in the back uh, on this side here, if you could. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Scott Ottoman with Inside U.S. China Trade. Uh, in the interim between the finance minister's meeting of the G20 and the leaders' meeting, I believe a senior uh, treasury official 
uh, said that it was a time to put meat on the bones of the framework that the finance minister had come out. I'd like to get your, your idea of what meat has been put on the bones. It seems like there's no uh, number involved with the indicative guidelines with respect to current account imbalances, and there was a discussion on whether to differentiate between currencies, uh, undervalued currencies uh, being subject to certain disciplines or just currency devalu devaluation in general, and it seemed like the more generic term ended up being used. I mean, could not one reading from the press reports uh, think this might be a step backwards in terms of getting action on the China currency issue? In fact, uh, with Germany seeming to uh, join China's side when it got expanded to current account imbalances given its uh, current account situation and the QE2 timing announcement seemed to rally a, a number of countries into complaining about U.S. policy. So I think, you know, you, um uh, you know, there's always a lot of noise uh, in terms of uh, statements to the press. Uh, countries have uh, reasons to address their domestic political audiences uh, in different ways. But of course, the test is in what was agreed. Where did you get consensus? And that, of course, is the communique document. And I think what you will see there, um, and the reality in the room, uh, was that we had unanimous support uh, for the framework, which did put um, important meat on the bones of the rebalancing framework uh, in a number of different ways. Perhaps most importantly, we got commitment to action. Very important. Um, big big uh, step uh, beyond what finance ministers and central bank governors had agreed. And of course, we had commitment at the political level, which is the most important thing. Uh, we got a timeline. This is going to happen very concretely. Develop indicators uh, that will serve as an early warning mechanism in the first half of the year. Develop the assessment of whether policy trajectories are consistent within the first year under the French presidency. Um, very clear uh, that the indicators would serve as an early warning mechanism. They would identify imbalances that would require, um, this is just the words on the page, uh, so I'm just quoting directly, preventive and corrective actions. Very clear uh, that surplus economies and deficit economies have shared obligations. Very clear that exchange rate policies are part of the policies uh, that will be assessed um, to uh, see their consistency with the commitments that were made. And there is very clear dis differentiation if you look at the exchange rate uh, language between countries that have obligations to move their currencies uh, in line with market forces, um, advanced economies that need to continue to be vigilant against um, uh, exchange rate volatility, and uh, those countries that have been um, essentially had policies of flexible exchange rates and have been subject to undue adjustment burdens because some of the other emerging markets have not been adjusting as much. So there's clear differentiation there, and there's a clear connection between the assessment framework and the need for uh, corrective policies. Thank you, Dong Hui Yu with the China Press. And uh, the G20 and the APEC uh, were regarded as the very important opportunity to push China to make more progress in uh, currency issue. And right now, the two meetings are over. Uh, I just wonder if your expectation before the meeting has been met. What would be your next expectation or certain goal for the uh, RMB's ap appreciation uh, before the visit by President Hu to Washington DC in January. Thank you. So let me um, state differently what uh, we thought our objectives were, uh, particularly the G20. Um, our objective at the G20 was to work with China uh, to reach agreement with China and other dynamic emerging market economies around an agenda that we thought was important, uh, which would provide a cooperative growth path forward uh, that would lead to um, a orderly adjustment of demand and a shifting of demand um, from deficit economies to surplus economies so that we would see higher growth overall and that exchange rates were an important part of that adjustment mechanism, in particular allowing exchange rates to move uh, in accordance with market forces. And we felt coming out of that that there was 
agreement that all the leaders signed up for that framework and it gives us a very good agenda going forward for making progress on these key issues. Now with regard to the bilateral um, discussions, I think President Hu and President Obama in their meeting, President Hu um, uh, reaffirmed uh, strong resolve um, to China's flexible exchange rate uh, regime and also reported on the progress that had been made uh, on that since they had last met. So good discussions bilaterally about that issue and again a cooperative framework uh, with all the members of the G20 to try to address these issues in a way that we think is win-win uh, going forward. Charles Chung from uh, Korea International Trade Association. Uh, you mentioned that the, the cross FTA and going into a G20 summit, uh, there were high hopes and the expectations for the, the uh, conclusion of the discussions, uh, but the, it was somewhat dis uh, disappointing. And the, there are some I reports uh, uh, for the other reasons uh, ranging from autos and beef. So what in your mind was the, the, uh, the essential uh, deal breaker and uh, how can both sides uh, come up with a solution uh, in the future. Thank you. Um, well, let me refer you to USTR um, for any discussion about the specifics of the negotiations, but simply say um, that both presidents are very committed, stated their commitment um, to reaching a good deal. Um, they've asked their negotiators to go back to work uh, towards that end. Um, we have confidence uh, that we can get there, that we can get uh, a good deal. Uh, and we weren't there yet uh, in Seoul. And what's most important, of course, um, is that we get a good deal. Uh, and uh, it is uh, worth doing that little extra bit of work um, to get uh, to a place where it's a strong deal, where we think it's going to make a material difference um, to uh, our workers, to our businesses, to our trade relationship. Uh, Lil, thank you. Let me invite Jack Pritchard to the podium for, uh, for a wrap-up. That was excellent. Uh, you've been generous with your time. Jack. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a terrific, uh, short, but compact uh, with information. Now, Mike started by talking about the potential of a, a superhero role uh, for Lael. And, and as I was sitting here taking notes, uh, she disqualified herself. She is far too articulate. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't fit well in that role. So we've got to come up with a new category uh, to justly reward uh, her actions and her capabilities. But let me, on behalf of CSIS and Mike, thank you for a terrific job as moderating Carl Jackson for leading off the questions on behalf of USKI and SICE and for my organization. You'll see the banner here, the Korea Economic Institute. Um, uh, we have uh, very much appreciated, uh, Leo, you taking the time to report so promptly uh, on uh, the economic implications of what occurred in Seoul and the, and the path forward. Uh, but more importantly, uh, even after your presentation, you entered into a conversation with people who are very interested in this, and you can tell by the type of the question uh, that they very much appreciated the fact that you were here. So on behalf of everyone, we want to thank you very much. I have one request. It's kind of an administrative request. Under Secretary uh, Brainerd has another appointment she has got to go to, so please don't cut her off at the pass as we get her into an elevator. Uh, I know she'd love to continue the conversation, but we'll have to do it at a different time. So please join me in thanking Under Secretary Brainerd. Thank you.